everybody, it's Adam from IHP. We're up to episode 12 of JC Unplugged here with the IHP staff. And as always, we just jump right into the questions unless you want to say hello. Hi, how are you doing? Cool, nice job. Any questions? Uh, what recommendations or resources would you suggest for someone starting out in the fitness field in order to develop their program? Help along with their program. Do so, so, resources for just programming? Yeah. seen for personal trainers designed to teach you how to create one hour programs, two, three, and even one time a week. Things that personal trainers face. Everything else I've seen from organizations to individual authors deal with uh, traditional periodization, macro cycle, meso cycle, micro cycle, I confuse the hell out of everybody, uh, volumes that are not, you know, that don't pertain to personal trainers. So that one, the functional training book that we have, <clears throat> has a very, very concise section on programming, which came from my programming book, but also teaches you how to program functional training and periodize functional training, which a lot of people don't even know can be periodized, and how to use hybrid training, which is combining traditional and functional training, and create short and long-term programs for personal trainers, everything uh, uh, one hour work. Because a lot of stuff is two-hour workouts. We've done uh, workouts by the National Academy of Sports Medicine when you actually do them. They're uh, an hour and 28 minutes and 28 minutes of lunging. And whoever did that doesn't do personal training. So I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't. Maybe, maybe there's something out there, but I haven't seen it. My program design book and my functional training book both have program for personal trainers. I would highly recommend those. What are your thoughts on training one limb and seeing some strength improvements in the opposite limb, yeah, maybe the injured or the untrained limb? Well, Helen Brent's research, that's 1980s, uh, used dynamometry and they, they showed that there was about 30% neural transfer from one to the other. But that, with that being said, and, and you know, you, you, can, you can look at practical things like, for example, write your name with the non-dominant. So if you're right handed, right name with the left hand. And you'll see that it's about 30% or 40% if you put a number subjectively, they're as good as the one on your right hand. But you can still do it. Now, how is it possible that a limb can do something that it's never done and do it pretty close? Because every time you write your name and you write with the right, there is some carryover to the left. So there, there's your neural transfer. Now, in terms of practical applications, you're right-handed, you're left-handed, you're going to have some dominance. So, for example, a right-hander will have a left glute hamstring complex that's stronger than the right because the right-hander kicks with the, the right, and does things with the right leg while the left leg balances. So those are the imbalances that we see. That has a huge impact on stride So if you're jogging and you have a huge just discrepancy, you might have, you know, a three-foot, and we've talked about this before, and uh, here you may have a you know four and a half foot. Okay, this is going to cause irregular rotation at the SI joint. This is going to cause irregular wear and tear on knees and and, uh, and ankles. The same thing applies to upper body if you're swimming, if you're doing something uh, symmetrical like running. The same thing will apply. apply. But we'll take it to the legs so everybody can see. This discrepancy will wear and tear one ankle more than the other, one knee more than the other, hip flexors more than the other, SI joint, one side more than the other. And so you start having your sciatica things going down one side after 40 years of this, 30 years of this because of this. So when you start doing one limb, what happens is you get, number one, you get a total performance increase. How do you do that? This may go to, by doing single leg squats, single leg anterior reaches, step ups, lunges, all that. This may go to, 4.0. This, since it's already pretty strong, goes to about 4.75. Right? So this, you make the big improvement. But look at what happens to your strike. It goes to 8.75 from a 7.5. So right off the bat, you had a huge performance gain. So in your 5K, you're going to be dropping time without knowing. But the good thing is that you're going to be wearing and tearing less those areas that you're overcharging because of this asymmetry. So you can apply this model that we just did for the legs of running to anything, swimming, running, or anything that's repetitive. 
You also have to look at if you're playing golf or if you're playing tennis and one side is bang, bop, bop, bop. Anything else that you do is also going to have this type of approach. So it, it's, it really, really, really makes a lot of sense to work single wings with your standing presses, your standing rowing, anything single leg, right side, left side, laterals, single leg balances, even things like um, your bench presses. Now a lot of them will come, chest press machines will come alternating. It's very, very <coughs> cool just to do one side. Try it, one side. Um, one side dumbbells, it gets iffy because if you're using 90 pound dumbbells on one side and you come down, that lever arm can kind of rotate and, and then what are you going to do? You're not strapped into the bench and it can get crazy. So I would say do it with the machines and then do a lot of this movement. So you're doing one side but using the other side to counterbalance. You know, dumbbell alternating. Use this to bone and then here. And that's a great way to go single limb. So I love the single limb stuff, man. I'm coming up with a product called the Eliminator. Nobody's seen it yet. But it's a single limb program. The product is simple. It could be any product. Man. The programming behind it, the philosophy behind it, what we're doing behind it, that's cool. And that's all centered around here. So I love it. Okay. Um... Clients that are struggling to achieve weight loss, how, how do you address them? You know, they, they, they claim to be eating correctly. You know they're coming in here to working out. They're just not dropping the weight. How do you, what's your, I guess more your uh, psychological approach with them? Well, you know, this is, this is as, as, we, as you know, we have a very, very huge component, it's very emotional component to everything we do here at IHB. Uh, we're into, energies and spirit and emotion and what makes you do things, what in your past has created the person that is and what decisions are, are, are made because of those things, that, that filter that you run your whole life by, and how, more importantly, how you project fear and how you deal with that projection. That's huge. So when you look at food, anybody that has an emotional component to food ingestion or to food intake, all right, is your candidate that's walking in here that wants to drop 10 pounds and they lie about the food because they're lying about everything else and it's that lie that got them heavy to begin with. Okay? So, oh, I didn't eat that. Oh, uh, you know, I, I, I ate what you said. No, you did not eat what I said. You know? Yes, uh, I have a slow metabolism. It, I've never seen a 200 pound person yet. I have never, I've never, I've measured uh, metabolic rates, resting metabolic rates extensively at the university level. And I've never seen a 200 pound guy have a uh, BMR of 1,000 calories. I haven't seen it yet. I have not seen it yet at all. Don't care about fat, body weight, nothing. I haven't seen that. So people who say, I ate what you told me to eat, and I haven't dropped weight, are lying. Plain and simple. You have never seen an obese person at a concentration camp. Because when you don't eat, you don't gain weight. You would be the sun fusion, creating energy from where there is none. So people eat, and they don't want to tell anybody. You want to know why? Because the food is their heroin. The food is their marijuana. The food is their cocaine. The food is their drug of choice to forget about whatever ails them. So they eat emotionally. They eat to celebrate. They eat late at night. They eat, they closet eat. So we have to make sure that that's not the case. Because if that's the case, it's like trying to fix an alcoholic and telling you that they don't drink or that they don't have an alcoholic problem. Impossible. So let's say that that is not the case. If that is not the case, which I would venture to say 90% of it is, if that is not the case, then we have to look at the only other thing is you don't know that what you're eating is bad. What person walking this planet with Google available doesn't know that mayonnaise will put fat on your ass? Nobody. Who know, who, who here, who here thinks that Kentucky Fried Chicken is a viable option to drop weight. Nobody. So then we're looking with a, straight, a few people that could use some information on frequency, uh, quality, and quantity of food. Don't buy this, buy that. They go, oh my God, you know how it's an information issue? You will say it one time and they'll fix their weight problems. When was the last time you had that issue? When was the last time any of you had that client? Where you say, oh, you don't know that's bad for you? Here, buy this, cook this, Eat that at these times, and boom, you never saw them again. Or the next time you saw them, you saw them shredded, they stay shredded the rest of their life. We've never seen that. Never seen it, because 
it's not an information problem. It's a I can't stick with it problem. Ha! Can't stick with it. You can't stop drinking. You can't stop doing drugs. You can't stop doing Oh, you can't stop. Why can't you stop? There's the problem. It's not nutrition. So, it's a huge spiritual and emotional component like this. That's the 11, that's the 800 pound elephant that nobody wants to talk about. Okay, so you have to create a generic language where you can talk about it. And then you gotta give them techniques so they can use techniques in the honeymoon phase. The honeymoon phase is that phase where they come in, they buy the membership, they pay for the training, and they go, I'm gonna do everything you say because I'm just, I'm tired of being fat. Or That's the honeymoon phase. You got you got them for about two to three weeks. That's it. You got them for about two to three weeks. If you don't have a huge impact in those two or three weeks, they're lost. I'm not saying that if, even if you do, you won't lose them. But if you don't have it, you're definitely lost. It's like 48 hours. You know, like that crime, the 40, if you don't catch them in the first 48, man, the chances are like, whoop, that you're going to catch them. If you lose them in the first three, you're, it's over. There is where you can say, okay, start with eating frequently. Start with eating these foods. Add these foods to that crappy lunch. Boom. Techniques. They will do the techniques while they're motivated to do you got about three weeks to switch over to that emotional stuff. Why are you eating at night? Okay, you gotta create a conscience. You gotta they, they gotta start asking themselves, man, am I am I entertaining myself? Am I self-medicating myself or am I really hungry? That's the question. And they gotta ask them. <clears throat> at first, they will only fix about five percent of the problem, but the more aware they become and the more control they are in their lives the more that awareness will grow, 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 grow until it's part of their being, and then they only screw up 20% of the time, which is cool. So that's a long story. It's a, but, but it's a very complex issue because the camera hangry, the four cameras, and the nine cap actually, that they didn't work in that. That didn't work it. We got 95% failure rate inside of the first five years of weight loss. <laughs> what business could, could, could grow on that? You know, you know what business? The failure business, which is a failure business. The supplement industry. The weight loss industry. 60 billion a year. 60 billion a year. Why? Because of the honeymoon phase. Everybody, boom, boom, boom. Unless you're one of us, that you're in for the long haul, and we all consume more fish oils. We all consume more CoQ10. Uh, CoQ10, alpha lipoic acid, or multi vitamins, multi minerals, uh, or TA65. We consume it for the long haul because we bought into it. We bought into it. The rest of the people consume it during the honeymoon phase, and it's just rolling, rolling. 600, what, 364 million people rolling on that called carousel. 60 billion and climbing every year. Did you get all that, Jordan? I did. <laughs> thank, thank God it's recorded. <laughs> okay. Um, can you speak to the value and importance of in-season strength training, and yet why it sometimes gets ignored or overlooked? <laughs> this is it's really, a pet peeve. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> it's unbelievable because the coach will say, <clears throat> "Practicing the game more will make them better." So they go, "No, no, we can't train because we we, we got to run plays. We can't train because we need more court time. We can't train because we need more this time, more that time, more that time." And they keep overlooking the fact that they lose a lot of games, some to technique, which the technique is important, the play is important, tactical and technical, but they lose a, lose a lot of it to condition. So that doesn't get that doesn't get looked at, and they lose a lot of it to strength, to get out, not out condition, out man, out power, okay? Out hustle, which is conditioning and strength combination. And they got some of their best players sitting on their asses injured. Like, how do you think that happened? So they have this wonderful preseason. Everybody shows up. Everybody's healthy. One month in, people start dropping by the wayside because you start losing your strength, and they don't understand how little is is needed to maintain strength. So two sessions that are 15, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes a week. Two sessions. So you're looking at a total investment of 40 minutes, half an hour a week investment to keep your players sharp, to keep your players strong through the entire season, that's a very small investment for a huge return. But they're so, so my, uh, uh, myopic and so short-sighted that they think more runtime, more gassers, more runtime. You're going to have all that gas you want. If you don't have enough horsepower, you're not outrunning anybody. So it is crucial. Not a lot is needed. I think you can get away for a little period with as little as three sets of five to six reps per major muscle group per week and maintain 
maintain strength or at least really, really reduce the decorum. God, who doesn't have that time? Who doesn't have that time? It's like telling me you don't have five, ten minutes to exercise per day. And the same person surfs Facebook for two hours. That's, that's asinine. So no, very important. As little as 15 minutes for, for an entire team, 20 minutes, twice a week, keeps your people sharp, keeps your people strong, keep your people off the bench. You're going to see huge gains later part of the season. That's where you're going to see the big gains. Right. And, and, I, and I think that they, the coaches think when they do the strength training, they have to go into an actual gym with, with weights, with, with uh, bars and machines to do all their strength training when they can actually do it on court, do it on the field. Man, we already talked about how, how, uh, how hard the body trains when you're doing things like a one-arm push-up. Uh, a one-legged squat. Okay, so a guy my size doing a single leg squat, you would have to double squat me with my weight on top of my shoulders. And of course, have the equipment, have the knowledge, have the skill. Or you can single leg squat me on the court. Hello, you know, even if my bench, even if my squat is 400, okay, you can still give me a 20 pound medicine ball and get me close to that with a single leg. Same one arm push. You can periodize functional training, so you don't need to do all that. So it's it's crazy to think. But you know what? That's all the excuses. That's all excuses. Okay. Talk a little bit about our approach when dealing with the younger kids that we have coming here. Six, eight, ten years old. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of parents, you know, when, when we go out and do talks at schools or demos at parks, they say, "How early can will you take kids?" And my answer is, depending on the maturity level of the kid, you know? If you have a kid who's got uh, no maturity level, no skills, because he doesn't play enough, then we would have to open up a, a room like this, romper room time for him, okay? But you have some eight-year-olds and, and seven-year-olds and ten-year-olds that are extremely, I would say, um, mature for their age, for lack of a word, or develop psychologically for, for their age. And they're very disciplined, they pay attention, they want to perfect their skipping, they want to perfect it. Is this right? Is this right? So, depending on, on the kid. So, I would say we can start, we can have them here as, as, as young as eight years old because it's appropriate. Okay? Best to go one on one if it's eight years old, and if it's a female. If not, specialized camps, I think, uh, would do a, a, a good job. Yesterday, we had 50 kids roll through this place. And this place is not big, 7,200 square feet, probably. Inside of seven, uh, five thousand workable area, five thousand square feet of workable area, we had fifty athletes with four trainers, right? Fifty athletes with four trainers running through about an hour and a half. They were doing everything. We put them on the Kaiser. Okay, we made sure that they were it was sized appropriately. If you have cables, the cables are really easy to work with small bodies because they can bring them anywhere they want. There were some that were, for example, the shoulder press. It was so high. And so why that they were like this? Okay, so we so we didn't do that. Chris and I went through what is appropriate. Boom, 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 boom. We fell. Okay, we spent 20 minutes out there learning biomotor skills. And if you let the kids play, that's fine. But if these kids were elite little leaders, so they kind of have to focus and have some kind of competitive. And and Chris will tell you, I talk to them like little adults. The importance of concentration, the importance of seeing the drill all the way through. Boom, and, and little by little, I mean, they transformed for us inside of 10, 10 minutes. It came from <laughs> all smiley and kind of nervous smile to here. I started using first names and last names that were on the shirts, you know. Good job, good job. And I, and I brought up the intensity, and they, biomotor skills were huge. They loved it. The parents were, yeah, that's what we need. Then we brought them in here, and we let them play. We had some medicine ball stuff that all of them could do. They played with the blades. Shake the blades. Shake the blades without shaking your body. You didn't get into like the crazy. And they were like this, having fun, figuring out new equipment. So we had some cool stuff that they all could do, bridges, crunches on stability ball, easy stuff. Then we had some rowing. All of them could do because they were fairly easy. Then we had some more challenging things. You know, um, what were those more challenging things that, that we had for them? That's it. I know that the blade was challenging, but they were doing this. All right, so they, they weren't perfect. We had step ups. Uh, we had five dot drills. All right. The anterior reaches were challenging because they couldn't even understand it. They had to balance on a single leg. So you, so you hands on the some of the more complex exercises that they needed help with. 
but it all went well. We finished with uh, treadmills. So those are the things. If you're dealing with little leads and you want to bring them into your gym the way we did yesterday, get two trainers. Anything over 10, 10 kids, especially 8, 10, 12 years old, get two trainers because you need hands on. All right? Here's your format. About 20 minutes outside or in a room of biomotor skills. If you can't run them, skip them. Skip them in place. Boom, in place. In place. Single leg hopping in place. Enter your reaches in place. Your inchworms, everything in place. So you, in a room this size, 900 square feet, you can get 13, 15 kids, you can get them working. Okay? Biomotor skills. Karaoke, side shuffles, uh, lunges with overhead reaches, uh, uh, Spider-Man crawls, uh, elephant walks, all of these. Boom. Then you go in and you set up five stations. There's ten, five stations, two per, two per. All right, and have them share a, a piece of equipment. Here we had a line of kinesis. All right, so we selected four or five that were good ones, and we had a cone with an exercise. So it would be rowing to a uh, anterior reach, uh, side core to a five dot drill. Then we went with a step up on kinesis. We didn't even do the cables. We gave them a ball, step up. We used the step on kinesis. You can use any step. Give them a ball, and then we had uh, a crunch. And on and on and on. We had blades, and then we had uh, bridges. Easy stuff. Rotate them. We rotated them on a 30 second work, 15 second transition. We put in a boxing uh, clock, really loud. Bing, 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 start. Bing, 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 halfway. Boom, boom, boom. And our fit moves forehand. And they just run it. Forget about, forget about reps. Have them all safe, kind of doing the exercise. We did that for about 20 minutes, and we finished with over, um, not over speed, but incline treadmills at about 35 to 48 degree incline. We only ran to, started at two and a half miles per hour, then we went to three, then we went to 3.5. And that was a workout. I just gave you what we did last night with the uh, 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 TBT Little League Elite Baseball. Little League team, about 10 years old. So that's an approach. We also had a basketball team, girls basketball team, a development basketball team here in Boca, and we had them in here, um, 950 square feet, and I think there were about 15 girls. Same thing that I, that, that I just mentioned to you guys, except no equipment uh, in terms of machines, all functional service. So you can get it done. We had about 20 parents sitting down where you can approach them, all 20 parents have more kids, all these kids have siblings, and all parents are asking, do you train adults too? Imagine that, so it's a great opportunity. Uh, you can go promo, you can promo the, the, the work, but don't promo it, exchange it. So for example, I'll give you 10 sessions if you give me a huge banner in your gym. You can exchange, never free. It's always gotta be some exchange thing, all right? Or you charge 100 bucks an hour, two trainers, you get a master trainer for about 40 bucks, okay, and an assistant for 20, something like that, that ratio, okay, and this is their opportunity to not only make a little bit per hour, but to market to parents. So it works for everybody. I just gave you a huge marketing tip, technical tip, setup programming tip, go make some money with Little League teams. All right, uh, last question, uh, nutrition question. What's the difference between creatine and beta alanine? Creatine, hey, I'm not the biochemist guy, you know, that's uh, Doug Counting and Joey Antonio and uh, Cliff Edberg and those geniuses, but this is my personal trainer take, okay? Creatine is energy. Look at it this way. Creatine is energy. Creatine works with the phosphate system, the ATP system, and what creatine does, it charges energy, tracks, boom, and, and blows up that phosphate bond, which is what produces the, uh, the energy. The creatine immediately loads. It's in there ready to load, and you're able to do more work. More work via more immediate energy loading inside the cell. Got it? The beta alanine works through the carnosine chain. Okay? Beta alanine works more by, uh, it's a great buffer, by neutralizing the hydrogen from the lactic acid that, remember, does not exist in your blood at no time. Could you ever pull out lactic acid out of any vein? any artery, any muscle, anywhere. It's part of a reactive system. As soon as it becomes uh, lactic acid, boom, this associates into lactate, which is what they measure, and hydrogen, which is what kills you, okay? The chronosine chain, beta alanine, attaches to the hydrogen neutralizing. So beta alanine works by buffering hydrogen, allowing you to work harder, and creatine uh, works with the immediate phosphogen system by loading energy right there 
carried immediately, so as soon as it's needed, it links in. Got it? Out of the both, it, uh, creatine has a tendency to volumize. So creatine will put weight on, uh, especially if you're a respondent. Uh, it'll put on weight because it, it, the first 30 days we know the, the initial weight is uh, uh, water. Beta alanine does not work in that uh, volumizing manner. So beta alanine is what you would recommend to anybody who's on a body, uh, body weight sport, you know, like combative sports. So remember that beta alanine doesn't volumize. Creatine volumizes. Creatine energy, beta alanine buffering energy. There you have it. See you guys there in a couple you. of weeks for episode 13. Have a safe week.